if you look to your bulletin, you will notice that we are singing hymns today. Because sometimes we just need to pull out our red books and look at music and sing out of our books together. So this morning we are doing a hymn sing. I don't have any other announcements except what is in your bulletin. So I'm going to come up here and join Becky to help lead instead of staying down here. And we, so please stand and join us in singing hymn 218, Thine is the Glory. Call to worship on the screen. Okay. People of God, open your ears. Come and celebrate the story of our God. The story of compassion and mercy of redemption and love. A story passed down so that God's people never forget. The one who our God has done. Please join me in prayer. God of power and might, let your love shine on us and through us to others. Take the blindness from our eyes and our hearts. Give us joy of knowing and serving you in all that we say, think, and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join together in hymn number 452, Here I Am, Lord.
It is time for our children to head off to Children's Church. You get to go to class now. Anyone else want to go? They've got fun things. I know Dottie has fun things planned in there. As they make their way over to the, to the door, join me in a prayer of blessing. Loving, giving God, we pray a blessing over all of the children. Your children here in our community and throughout the entire world. We pray that they know you. We pray that they listen, that they hear, and that they feel your presence always. In the name of Christ, amen. The sun is coming through those windows. It means i got to step forward a little bit. I kind of like it. <laughs> so this morning, we are starting a new sermon series that's actually going to last quite a while. We are going to be following the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul is actually a really big reason why we have Christianity in the structure that it exists today. Paul's theological reflections that we read about in his letters are foundational for how our faith has been structured and how the church itself became structured. But not everyone likes Paul. And I have to admit that before I went to seminary, I was one of those people. But really, can you blame me? I mean, there are some things written in Paul's letters that have actually been misused to say that women can't be leaders in church. Why would I want to read Paul? <laughs> However, in seminary, my New Testament professor really helped redeem Paul. Through the course, through that course, I really got to know Paul, Paul's faith, Paul's journey. Paul's purpose in his letters and his teachings, and how a lot of those teachings actually have been misused to promote power and control over Jesus' message of love and compassion. So Paul was an incredible and passionate, faith-filled, flawed, person who did his absolute best to follow the call that God had given him, the call to spread the gospel, the good news of Christ throughout his known world. So usually when we think about Paul, we start thinking about, what do you start thinking about? Road to Damascus, if you want to start at the beginning. Right, his Damascus Road experience where he sort of began, but that actually wasn't the beginning. We've got to back up a little bit. We have to back up to the beginning because we know that both how and where we were raised plays a huge part in the people we are today, right? It influenced how we see the world. It influenced our ideas, our opinions, how we engage with ideas that are different than our own, how we engage and interact with people. So Paul was born in Tarsus, which was a very large metropolitan city on the eastern edge of the Roman Empire. And Tarsus was what they called a free city. That means that Tarsus got to govern itself with very little oversight from the Romans. This made it a very desirable place for a lot of people to live, which meant it had a lot of diversity. And it actually had become a vast cultural and intellectual center. So there were lots and lots of different philosophical, theological, faith, ideas, floating around and being discussed and being lived together. Now, Paul was Jewish. 
He was born the tribe of Benjamin, which is important because that tribe was really known for raising up strong leaders and strong warriors. And during the, Babel, the time of the Babylonians, the tribe of Benjamin had been deported and scattered all the way across the empire and had never come back together. And Paul's parents were Roman citizens, which is kind of unique. Only about 10% of the Roman Empire were actual citizens. What that tells us is that Paul's parents were most likely incredibly wealthy. And when they had their son, they chose to name him Saul after the first king of Israel. High, big shoes to fill, right? High expectations. What these things mean is that Paul, Saul, Paul, had a really privileged upbringing. He had all of the things. He had all of the education that being in Tarsus could have provided. And then, at the ripe old age of probably somewhere of 10 to 12, his parents sent him off to Jerusalem because they had high expectations of him. They sent him off to learn from the priests and the rabbis how to be a priest, how to be a leader, a teacher of the Jewish faith. Oh, I love that physical look because technically he couldn't have, he shouldn't have been able to be a priest because of the Levites, but remember they were scattered and things sometimes got a little confused. So he had he wanted to be a priest. He was headed towards a rabbi. So Adam Hamilton, who is the author of the book that I'm using as sort of a guide to mark our pathway on this on this series, pulls scriptures from a couple of different of Paul's letters to put into Paul's own words how he describes his upbringing. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, in Silica, a citizen of an important city, circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, brought up in Jerusalem at the feet of Gamaliel, educated strictly according to our ancestral law, being zealous for God, I advanced in Judaism beyond many among people of the same age. Paul's words tell us that he did in fact have one foot in two different worlds, in the Roman world and the Jewish world, which meant that he was able to navigate among and between different cultures. And Paul saw himself as a rising star in the temple, highly educated in scripture, highly ambitious, and a very firm, faithful follower of God's laws. And Paul's life was preparing him for something special, something unique, because his upbringing gave him really unique skills, skills that were really going to be needed to spread the message of Christ beyond the temple, beyond Jews. It gave him the skills that were needed to deal with the obstacles that were going to come along as he tried to do that. His upbringing made him the one who was uniquely qualified for this call. So I wonder, what has your childhood, your upbringing, your life so far uniquely qualified you to do? Because be certain God is calling you to do something. God calls us all to something for God's glory. And what we're being called
multitude is often not what we want it to be or what we expect it to be. I know mine wasn't. This was not my plan. Not my plan. And Paul, Paul didn't believe that this was what he was being prepared for. He didn't know he was being prepared to go off and do something new and radical and dangerous. He believed he was called to be a rabbi, possibly a priest. He was called to be a leader and a teacher. He was called to protect God's people. And during this time, the Jewish followers of Jesus' way were seen as a threat to God's people because they were spreading the teachings of Jesus, who, as we know from Jesus' life and ministry, sometimes really pushed against what the temple was teaching. Which means these followers of Jesus' way were seen as breaking Jewish law possibly even trying to push against how worship was being done in the temple, how things were happening. And so Paul, a devout, faithful, zealous follower of the law, <coughs> took it upon himself to begin a crusade, a crusade to stop the spread of what he saw as a corrupted version of the faith. Now we read about his crusade in both Acts 8 and Acts 9, and this morning all of the scripture I'm reading, I'm using the voice translation. In Acts 9 we read, some devout men buried Stephen and mourned his passing with loud cries of grief. But Saul, this young man who seemed to be supervising the whole violent event, was pleased by Stephen's death. That very day, the whole church in Jerusalem began experiencing severe persecution. All of the followers of Jesus, except for the apostles themselves, fled to the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Young Saul went on a rampage, hunting the church, house after house, dragging both men and women to prison. And a little later on in Acts 9, Saul, this fuming, rageful, hateful man who wanted to kill every last one of the Lord's disciples, he went to the high priests in Jerusalem for authorization to purge all the synagogues in Damascus of followers of the way of Jesus. His plan was to arrest and chain any of Jesus' followers, women as well as men, and transport them back to Jerusalem. So Saul, Paul, was on a mission that he believed was ordained by God. A mission to keep the faith exactly as he had learned it. No changes allowed. A mission not just simply to discredit, but to actually destroy the lives of everyone who he disagreed with, who he saw as having a wrong understanding of God, a wrong faith. I found myself this week sort of sitting with that and thinking about our world today and wondering, because I see and hear people saying and doing things in the name of God, things that cause harm, things that are hateful, hurtful, destructive. And I wonder if they feel a little bit like Paul felt during this time, that they feel that their understanding of God is the only one that is valid. That they feel like they need to protect people, that they need to guard the gates of the faith. And that the 
this crusade, this hurtful behavior, is actually God ordained. God called. I mean, Paul certainly believed that what he was doing was God's mission for him. But it wasn't. And Paul needed a course correction. A course correction that apparently only God could give him. Now, I know looking back on my life, there have been some pretty hard course corrections from God. And when I look before them, I could see God trying to help me before that point, which made me wonder, how many times did God try and get Paul to change? How many different things did God try? How many different ways did God get, try and get Paul to understand who Christ was, what Christ was doing in the world, what the faith should look like? But God didn't get Paul's attention, right? And so we have this road to Damascus moment. Took extreme measures to get Paul's attention. I can relate to that. This is how Paul describes that moment as he was on his way to Damascus with the authority and permission of the temple in Jerusalem to persecute those who followed Jesus. This is Acts 26, 12 through 15. On one occasion, I was traveling to Damascus, authorized and commissioned by the chief priest to find and imprison more of his followers. It was about midday when I saw a light from heaven brighter than the noonday sun shining around my companions and me. We all fell to the ground in fear, and then I heard a voice. The words were in Aramaic. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? When you kick against the cattle prods, you're only hurting yourself. I asked, Lord, who are you? And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Get up now and stand upright on your feet. I have appeared to you for a reason. I am appointing you to serve me. You are to tell my story and how you have seen me. And you are to continue to tell the story in the future. And just like that, Paul changed. His heart changed. He got it. Have you ever had a moment like that? Where suddenly, lightning bolt, light bulb on, I won't tell you what happened to me. That's a different story. And you just got it. Suddenly you understood. You had it. And you wanted, no, you needed to share it with other people. Maybe yell it, scream it, get in people's faces, yell it from the rooftops. You needed to share what was going on. This was so important. You needed to just get at it. And I'm sure that Paul's heart felt that way in that moment. And God knew that this was not the time for Paul to just jump in with both feet and head forward with this new understanding of Christ that he had. Remember, Paul was a very zealous man. And if he was zealously persecuting in this direction, and he suddenly had a different thing, there was a good chance that he was going to send that same energy in the other direction. Have you ever met anyone like that? I think God knew that that's what Paul would do. And so Paul needed a break. And Paul needed some humility. Don't we all? So God gave Paul both a break and some humility by literally blinding him for three days. He had to stop. And then 
God thinks another way to help Paul in this situation is to send him Ananias, who was one of the followers of Jesus who Paul was heading to Damascus to persecute. Instead, Ananias comes along to heal Paul and baptize Paul and teach Paul in that order. Paul had his huge aha moment, and instead of getting on the road and getting things going, he stops. He sits. He spends time in the dark with God, praying. He spends time listening and learning from someone whose faith was diametrically opposed to the one that he held. Which made me really wonder how often we follow Paul's example there. How often do we just stop? and sit with God and really listen and see where God is guiding us and see who God is sending us to guide us. And in that, how well do we listen? How well do we listen to what other people are saying and thinking and believing before we jump in and tell them what we know is right, what we want to make sure they understand. Paul had to learn those lessons before he could move into his actual ministry that God called him to. It's his life that teaches us a lot. We spend a lot of time digging into Paul's letters and looking at the theology, but what we're gonna do now is look at the lessons that Paul's life and his ministry really have for us. Not just about the good stuff, not just about the good news of Christ, but about the challenges that come along with being followers of Christ, with sharing the gospel. Paul's journey was not one for the faint of heart. We will see that as we walk along with him. I mean, right from the beginning, Paul learns that this is not going to be easy. It's going to be a huge challenge. After he spends some time learning from disciples, from followers of Jesus, he begins to go to the temple. He begins to teach. And we read in Acts that as his confidence grows and his teaching becomes a little more bold, people start noticing and paying attention. But they don't like it. And they want him kicked out of the temple. They want him discredited. In fact, some of them even begin a plot to try and kill him. And that's where we're going to leave Paul today. The moment when Paul, who has gone from being profoundly known as a persecutor of the people who follow Jesus' way, to now becoming one of the persecuted. In your bulletin, there is a little quarter sheet. I need my glasses that I left up here. This is this is a new song. Amanda's actually the one who found it in a book that I gave her. 
And it is beautiful and amazing. So join me in singing the tap sheet, which is 171 Body Broken. <laughs> Just as Paul was a sinner. If we ask, Christ will forgive our sins. Christ turned Paul and his beliefs around, and he can do the same for us. All he asks is that we repent and ask forgiveness, and it is given. Let's begin anew. Come, join us in partaking of communion with one another and with Jesus Christ our personal Savior. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to each one of them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup, and he blessed it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my blood, forming a new covenant in love. Take, drink. Please pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your birth, your life, your examples, your death, and your resurrection. The temple curtain was torn, allowing us a personal connection to you. Forgive us our sins and help us to go into this world as faithful followers, praising you. Amen.
I'd like to share with you today a story that I was a part of a few years ago. I was walking into Walmart one day and there was a young couple outside with their dog asking if anybody could spare some spare change. I decided to give them some and then I went in the store and did my shopping. As I was checking out, I saw them in another line beside me. I was curious about what they were buying and wondered how they would spend the money. Much to my shame, I saw that they were buying dog food. Why do I say my shame? Because it was none of my business how they spend the money that I gave them, and I learned a valuable lesson in judgment and unconditional giving. God made this very clear in his intentions with our tithes and offerings in Malachi 3, 10. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So I encourage you to be generous in your tithes and talents and have faith that God will use them abundantly, far beyond what we can imagine. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit, thank you for your reminder in Malachi that you are a generous God who loves us beyond measure. And please help us to hold tight to the faith and trust we have in you that what we give will be used to increase your kingdom on earth unconditionally and in great abundance. In Jesus' name, amen. And the tithing baskets are on either side or you can tithe online. Well, I know that even though no one gave me a little slip of paper with a prayer or a praise on it, um, we have uh, Lori Case has a praise that Miranda's appointments this last week went very well. And I also know that you all have things in your heart, whether they are joys or that they are prayers. So as we lift those up to God, join me in prayer. Living God, you meet us in unexpected places and surprise us with the abundance of your love. Restore our sight so that we may see Christ clearly. We come to you this morning, God, with a multitude of prayers in our hearts and in our minds. We pray for all who are persecuted for their faith. We pray for their freedom, their peace, and their safety. We pray for everyone who's struggling with anger, with intolerance. Give them new hearts and new lives that glorify you. We pray for everyone who is suffering with illness, with grief, with pain, with sadness. Give them healing, hope, and joy. We pray for the faithful of every nation, and may we use our voices to praise your name. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let us stand together and sing our closing hymn, 469. What am I thinking?